Welcome to Blue Grit Radio, the podcast that explores making better cops for a better community. I'm your host, Eric Tong. I've been an active police officer since 2007. We will dive into the aspects of police culture, health and wellness, leadership, and mindset. You'll hear from experts not only from policing, but all industries as they relate to being our best with purpose, passion, and positivity. Join me as we share stories, lessons, and advice so we can all be better for ourselves, our teams, our families, and our communities. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Blue Grit Radio. This is your host, Eric, and today I am joined by retired Sergeant Danny Kuhn. Danny, how are you doing today, man? I'm real good, Eric. Yourself? Good, good. Well, you're retired and you're clearly busy. You're active. Uh, We're going to talk about your book. We're going to talk about these really critical topics of first responder, mental health. We're going to talk about police suicide specifically. Um, But before I start on these heavy topics, I do want the listeners to listen a little bit about you and yourself, what brought you into law enforcement and how your career went and how you're doing now. How are you doing? My name is Danny. I am a retired Los Angeles County Deputy Sheriff. I retired in 2013 at the rank of Sergeant. And I spent the the last three years of my career was a sergeant. Um, Of my 31 years, I spent 30 of those assigned to various patrol stations, ranging from South LA, East LA, North Los Angeles County. And I uh, was fortunate to spend eight years on an island called Catalina Island, which is 22 miles off the coast of Los Angeles. I was the sole detective there in a community of about 5,000 and uh, stayed busy all the time. But uh, ever since I was a little kid, I always wanted to be a cop. Now, my dad was a reserve officer for Santa Ana Police Department, and I'd see him in uniform. I'd go, I want to be a cop. I want to be a cop. My little brother, he wanted to be a firefighter. So that worked out good for both of us. Yeah, good. I, uh, you know, in my teen years, I became an explorer with a local police department in the city we lived in. He eventually joined the Army, spent three years in the Army as a military police, and then got hired with Los Angeles County. And uh, in L.A. County, I worked as a patrol deputy a uh, team leader, uh, excuse me, a patrol training officer, a detective team leader, a detective, and then a sergeant. And also, sadly, I worked 18 months of, or did 18 months in living hell just to work the county jail. I was assigned to custody division for Hmm. nine months. And those of us on uh, the sheriff's farm, we say it was, yeah, that's our jail time. We did, we went to jail. That's the front end of your career, right? Like you have to start as a corrections deputy. Yes, sir. At that at that time, you could. See, that's where you started at. Now mm. it's um, depending on staffing, uh, sure. for the, either the courts, transportation, or custody. Yeah, but it was it was a great thirty or yeah, great thirty one years. When I retired, we moved out of Los Angeles County and moved uh, down into Northern San Diego County, just basically right up next against um, Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton. And you know, throughout my career, I'd always heard about people talking about. Um, just stress at the beginning of my career that it was just called stress, mm. uh, stress, 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 stress. And then eventually near the end of my career at the start of, uh, actually after desert storm, then going into, uh, the, uh, the global war and terror, you'd hear a lot of guys coming out of the military or even in the military claiming about PTSD. And I used to think of post-traumatic stress disorder. What a joke. You know, these people are just weak. And, uh, after I got out, you know, I'm living in a Marine Corps community now. And I start meeting guys and that had come back from deployments that are having issues. And I started to believe that this is a real thing, and it, and it is. And uh, in 2018, shortly after my, or the day after my dad passed away, you know, I just lost it. And all of these emotions from years and years and years are just burying stuff down inside of you. Because as cops, we are excellent at compartmentalization. We just stuff mm-hmm. stuff down and it never comes back up. Well, it came back up. Uh, around the same time in 2018, I learned that in the first community or first responder community, more law enforcement officers, more firefighters were dying by suicide than they were in the line of duty. And that, that shocked me. And, and mm-hmm. uh, we got to do something about this. And I started studying more about um, post-traumatic stress injury. I've made some friends that are uh, in the industry on the uh, military side of it. One of them is the uh, co-founder of Mighty Oaks Foundation. Him and I are very good friends. And uh, he's also a uh, a pastor. And 
uh, Mighty Oaks is faith based, and he has told me all kinds of stories of, of what these guys go through. And including on the military side, we hear that it's 22 a day. Well, obviously, it's more than that. On the law enforcement side, last year we had 128 reported suicides in, in law, in law enforcement. And that's reported. And I say that very strongly because that's probably only 50, maybe 60 percent of all suicides um, committed by law enforcement officers. So it's the reporting is the issue. Fortunately, reported suicides last year were down from. Uh, 200 and some odd a couple of years ago. Hmm. But that's a, it's a very important topic. I think there's several like you, like myself and, and others who are in this arena and we're just bringing awareness to uh, our cops to let them know, Hey, there's, there's things going on out there that you need help with. And, and it, it, the big thing for me is talking to somebody about it. You know, sadly so far this year, there have been eight reported suicides. It's sad to say that there's eight, but those also numbers are down. Um, we average about one law enforcement suicide every 48 hours. So far this year, we're down to, to one every 3.5 days. So that's a fortunate thing. Yeah. And for the listeners, you know, this episode may air in the you know early spring, but we're recording it uh, right at the end of January. Like this is just for context, this is January 30th, right? To have eight already is so disheartening. You know, I kind of want to recap some of the things and revisit some of the things you talked about. I really appreciate that rundown, crash course of a little bit of Sarge uh, Danny Kuhn. Uh, but, you know, it, there's so much to reflect on. And first off, thank you for your service. Uh, I think increasingly a quote unquote full career is becoming more rare. And it's not to say, hey, if you're in it and you've had your fill, like, Thank you for your service, whether it's 5, 15, whatever years, but for you to go 31, uh, greatly applaud you and appreciate that for setting the tone. Um, now, with that, I also really appreciate the self-reflection, and a lot of that sounds like after your career, right? Um, you shared that you were the guy that heard um, you know, certain things about post-traumatic stress and was like, well, that's just you're just weak, right? Maybe it's a lack of resilience. Maybe it's a lack of mental fortitude. But for you to reflect on that, share back that you were truly suppressing a lot of this, I think this is an increasing recognition that a lot of our senior officers, a lot of our senior leaders, or recently retired um, service folk are recognizing. And you're, and you're correct. You know, back Let's look back 30, 40 years ago. My career started 40 years ago, even, you know, and even farther back than that. We were always taught you suck it up. Suck it up, buttercup. That's, that's what you do. Mm -hmm. You know, you let it slide off your back. You, you, you go to one call. You, know, you can go to one call and you're doing a burglary report in a, a million-dollar home. And five minutes after you leave that call, you could be handling a, a mass shooting, you know, in the vario of your or the, in the bad parts of town in your, in your patrol district. And then after that, after you clear that call, you could be going on to another, you know, someone illegal parking car, some illegal park car calls like that. And it's, you don't have time to reflect when you're working, especially in the big cities. Now, we, when you go down to these smaller towns, around 50% of all police departments in the United States are 50 people or less, or 50 officers or less. And that's, I never realized that until I saw it a couple months mm -hmm. ago. And how do these guys reflect? You know, when I would get off work, I was working a shift of, of anywhere from five to 20 other people and we could get together and, and just, yeah, Hey, that was a lot of fun, blah, blah. And just go on like that. But these guys in these small towns, you know, they may be one police officer, one deputy sheriff for 50, 60, a hundred and some odd square miles. And these guys have nothing to do to, to when they get off work and all they're doing is just stuffing it down and stuffing it down. And eventually they're going to break. Something that uh, I just started noticing recently and is the amount of veterans that are coming back. We have a lot of reservists. All police departments have a lot of reservists in them. And they're coming back from the deployments over the last 10, 15 years. And so they they hit it on both sides. They're getting the, the actual real-life war scene um, stress on one side. And then they're getting to what I call community. PTSD is where everything just adds up over time, and they're getting it on both sides, and and that's something that I hope there's going to be some new statistics on is the amount of 
officers who are actually veterans or reservists, active duty or, or reserves who have been deployed mm-hmm. and how that's going to relate. And it's, it's very interesting, the, the whole thing. But now in the last probably 10 years, maybe a little bit less, there's been some insight uh, among the working people, I would say from uh, the lower level management, from lieutenants on down or captains even maybe on down uh, on the issue. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think in the higher echelon of, of the rank schedule up in the sheriff area or the uh, police chief areas or assistant chiefs or assistant sheriffs, I don't think it's reached there yet. It's mm-hmm. slowly getting there. Um, but, I, you know, I, I like to say I think the administration kicks the can down the road. Uh, but on the lower level, we're starting to talk about it. And, and, and you're starting to talk about it in briefings. You know, I've written articles for uh, union newspapers uh, that are geared towards the sergeant and the lieutenants in the unions so they can start opening their eyes to what's going on in, in this issue of post-traumatic stress injury and yeah. you know, suicide ideation. Yeah, and that's fantastic. And it culture change is hard in general, right? I like to listen and read about organizational culture and tr- culture in general, but it's even harder for first responders, right? It's even harder for military in these very traditional based organizations, right? For a lot of reasons. And some things are good, right? The values in, instilled. But when we talk about shifting culture and shifting what encompasses leadership or what, uh, what focus we should put on wellness and how we should integrate that directly in with the culture that it's going to take time, but it's not to say it's not worth it. I think the grind is absolutely not only worth it, but it's necessary and good on you to realize that by instilling it, by sharing it, continuing to talk about it, it's going to become second nature, right? It'll be one of my bosses likes to remind me that Although I get impatient when I hear a couple of years, I'm like, a couple of years, man, like, <laughs> why don't we do this like today or tomorrow? But he's like, man, like, just think like a couple, a couple of years is pretty quick because as you kind of noted, it seems like a lot of police leaders at the top echelon, right? The executive level might not be on board. Now, I like to recognize, um, and maybe because I, you know, am in the space and I am connecting more with higher ups because I'm a little higher up at this stage of my career where I recognize a lot of good leaders doing a lot of good things. And so that makes me really hopeful, right? And I think that it's the more we talk about it, the more it'll make sense. Um, but it might not be the norm, right? And so if you're speaking to sergeants and you know lieutenants, commanders, and especially the line level, I mean, the line level are going to be your chiefs and sheriffs one day, right? So it's kind of that long game. And I appreciate that. I mean, it's it's how we need to focus the message and just make it make it normal, right? Make it the expectation when they get up to that seat. Um, one thing I like to suggest, and you know, wellness is so critical to us. But one thing I like to suggest, and I'm kind of surprised it's not seen this way, but even the old school, right, that we talk about, they should recognize that officers, deputies are an extremely, if not the most valuable resource they have. And, you know, the last few years have shown that in spades as far as not having enough people to do the job that you need to do. And how do you keep them? Well, you got to support them, right? You got to support their wellness. You got to support their mindset. You got to make them uh, feel validated. You got to feed into their mental health and you got to feed into their physical well-being and their work-life balance, all these things so that they can come in, put on the uniform and do the job. That's, that's correct. And, and what I'm doing is, uh, what I'm seeing is I belong to several Facebook groups and social media groups that are, are uh, first responder, police and fire and law enforcement um, specific related and one of the one of the groups is a retirement group of just california cops another one is um just active and retired los angeles county deputy sheriffs other ones are uh um, our nationwide facebook groups and what i'm starting to see among the retirees they're starting to to realize that hey this is a problem and while they're not actively getting out there to to help solve the problem, they're supportive of what myself 
and what others are doing. And so that that's a great big thing is because is I feel once I was done with serving the community, and that was a lot of fun, but once I was done with that, now I have to serve, I feel to myself, I have to serve my law enforcement community. And, and to, to get these guys in line it is worth it. And, and when I, I, I tell every retiree, that is our job now. We, we're not serving the public anymore. We have to serve our own. Mm-hmm. And just by uh, actively supporting it, um, it's, it's a good thing. You know, unfortunately, I, I run across these guys every once in a while that like to deflate the tire. I had one guy from North, one northwestern uh, large city, not in Washington state. And uh, he he just, he was a retiree and, and I posted something about a guy that did, had died by suicide and that we have to keep, stop the stigma, keep the conversation going. That's what I'm always wanting to do. Let's keep talking about it. And he just lamb blasted. He just hit me from each side saying, oh, these guys are weak. You're weak. And said some words that uh, you can't say on television. Mm-hmm. And all kinds of stuff. Just rude. Yeah. And, uh, you know, every once in a while you hit guys like that. But for the most part, um, with the, with among the retirees, uh, I'm, I'm getting a lot of support, and that's good because that's that's, that's what we have to do. Yeah, man, it's so disheartening, right? And even for a retired um, individual to still be in that toxic space, right? It's kind of it's kind of a bummer that you hear that toxicity doesn't just leave when you take off the uniform. Because I see why toxicity exists. I see where it comes from, the cynicism and all that. Uh, but it, yeah, it's really sad. And uh, I would venture to guess that that individual has a lot of stuff he's dealing with, has a lot of hurt that he's suppressing. And it's really too bad. Um, but no good on you, I think, to to rally the retirees in a way, right, through your groups um, and be an advocate for those in the job. But I also want to reflect that that's huge what you're doing for the retire community, because, you know, even as uh, people like us might be talking about those that wear the badge, and the support they need to continue doing that. I mean, what about life after the badge? Because a lot of this is because of that, right? We want to recognize that it's a huge identity, right? It's 30 plus years of your life. You wanted it since you were a kid, and it changes how you look at the world. It changes how you interact with your family. It it becomes an integrated part of you, but that's a hard balance too, and right? So I know that that's a common thing with retirees or soon-to-be retirees is really having to reflect and having some discourse within themselves as they have to adapt to this new life. And we know the stats, right, as far as retirees losing a sense of purpose and not having a fruitful life and maybe having a shorter lifespan also because of unhealthy practice, unhealthy coping me- mechanisms through their career. So I'm curious what your thoughts are on all that. I know I threw a lot at you. Oh, yeah, it, it's right. Um, you know, last year on November 6th, I call it a a very dark, dark time for the Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. In a 24-hour period, four members of the Sheriff's Department died by suicide. One of those was a retiree. Mm-hmm. And within, it was the second reported suicide that day. And within the retirement community, that just struck home for a lot of the guys. They're going, how can this happen? But then I go back, uh, there's a retired um, lieutenant from the Pima County Sheriff's Department, Kevin Gil Martin. He is a uh, psychologist, and he wrote a book um, basically talking about the – lost my train of thought there. He, he's talking about the uh, hypervigilant roller coaster. Mm-hmm. And, and what it is is when you're working, you're spending your day, you're on this roller coaster, you're going up to your highs and down to your lows, and up to your highs and down to your lows. And, and over time, you're just not recovering from that. And there's a, another article from a, a, a doctor, I, his name escapes me right now, and his na- this article for this chapter is in my book, where he talks about the hypervigilant cliff. Hmm. And he's talking about guys who have five, six, seven years on the, on the job, it would be like stepping off a curb. It, it, they don't have that far to fall if they, when they fall, because you're going to fall. They don't have that time, far to fall when they fall. Uh, and, and they can recoup easier. But the more time you get on the job, the more stuff you're just stuffing down in, into you. And at the, at the end of a 30-year a career, that's a that's a long, that, that's like you know, a big cliff you're stepping off. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't um, take care of yourself in retirement, 
then you're going to have issues with that. And, and you know, from the pending retirement where I've read articles of a, a deputy chief from New York Police Department back in 19, or excuse me, 2019, he was two weeks from retirement. He died by suicide because he couldn't, like you said, he, he lost his purpose in love. He was being forced to retire. Mm-hmm. He was aging out and, and he had nothing else to, to look forward to. Down to the same year in 2019, a, a Long Beach, California um, police officer, retired sergeant, walked into his, the old precinct, the old station where, you, where he worked at, and died by suicide there by shooting himself in the head. And it's like, mm-hmm. because he had been retired two years, he lost all hope of anything to go on in the future. And what we need to do as retirees, and what you can look forward to as a re- when you're retired, mm-hmm. is to continue on the mission just in a different scope. And I was, I was talking to a guy uh, a couple of weeks ago. He had retired. He he does a blog on the same, or he blogs and podcasts on the same subject. And and he was going through a dark day. And I go, dude, just because your your, your service time for the public is over, but your service time for the, for the rest of us aren't. You, you, God's putting you in a different position and showing you a different route to go, so you can continue on with your mission of helping people. Yeah, and, uh, I absolutely and, and, believe and that. That's what we need to do. We need to to start the conversation. You know, suicide is one thing that we all know about, but nobody talks about. Mm-hmm. It's like that that hidden thing nobody wants to talk about. Hey, you know, go up to your friend. You, you've had some bad days. I had a a partner. You, this was back in the eighties, before peer counseling and before you know, I most departments even knew what outside of stress was anything more than um, PTSD. And that wasn't even a, an acronym then. But uh, uh, this friend, he was he was a friend, a, more of an acquaintance. We worked opposite shifts. For some reason, we ended up this one night working a shift together. And he asked me and at the end of the shift, he could sit down and talk to him, and he just needed to vent. And, and he vented, and he was he was on the edge. His, his, his having marital problems, having problems obviously at work having uh, other issues going on financial issues and he was at the end and and all i did is sit there and listen to him and and uh he went on and had a successful career which is good but it's it's those type of incidents what we need to do is just sit down and 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 talk to people listen if they have it If, if if you see someone in a bad way and and they uh they look like they they're having issues are you okay there's nothing wrong with that you know i'll send out a I'll send out emails or Facebook posts and, and to my friends or messengers or any, any way I can via social media. Um, hey, if you're having an issue, let me know. And mm-hmm. right now I have a little little group of friends that uh, are having some medical issues. So I'll send them a text. You okay? Everything good? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, it buddy check, and, right? And, and you got to do buddy checks. If you don't, mm-hmm. you know, who knows what's going to happen? Yeah. Yeah. I applaud that effort, right? And it's just a little bit of attention, a little bit of intention. And there's a lot you cover. And I kind of want to go back on a few things where, you know, we're talking about a sense of identity. And there's so much to be proud of this job, right? It's not to shirk it away or to deny that this is a lifestyle, right? I posted something about this this notion and the work-life balance some time ago. And there was a cop on, uh, you know, my Instagram that said, you know, I don't, this is just a job. And yeah, I like the job, but he was kind of hating on the people that recognize it's a lifestyle. And I'm like, okay, I'm not going to get into the, you know, the banter, like the trollish kind of back and forth. But yes, there is a healthy balance. And that's different for everyone. But it's not, it's just not a job, right? You don't look at the world the same way. You can't conceptualize danger for yourself and for your family the same way. Uh, it's it's just not right, and yeah, there might be an unhealthy level where you have no other hobbies and no friends outside of police work. Um, but but if you if you hear that and you think that that might be you, it's okay. Like you can recognize that and reflect on that, and then pay a pay specific attention towards shifting that. Right, uh, pay specific attention towards the things that feed you that aren't directly related to the job. And one suggestion, because I've been pondering it so much, and hearing different anecdotes is that there's so much positive um, stuff in the job. That's the reason why we get into it, right? We want to serve, we want to protect, uh, we're empathetic. But think about the themes that led you to the job and then where else you might apply that, right? So for a lot of people, they, they want to help and they want to be useful. And a lot of people want to share their story. 
And other people don't want to share their story. They just want to do the, you know, the boots on the ground kind of quiet work in the background. Well, there, there are so many organizations, there are so many efforts, uh, whether it's directly helping those that have served, right? Like kind of like you're talking about this community um, or just like the community at large, right? There's other applications where you don't need a gun and a badge to do it. But at the same time, man, what better advocate for law enforcement, someone that's been there uh, that could speak to some of the challenges that law enforcement continues to go through, right? So sometimes it is an amazing asset just to have someone that knows what's up when you're having these little interactions in the community and there's distrust in the police in this regard or questioning of legitimacy in that regard. Like, hey, you can be an advocate. You can be an active community member. There's so many things for you. That, that's correct. There's there's out there. Um, you, you go back to, and I'll, I'll get back to um, Kevin Gilmartin and the, the hypervigilance cycle, because that's part of that um, work, rest, um, yeah, balance thing. Mm-hmm. It is, you know, when you, I worked for oh, probably uh, half of my career, an eight-hour shift, and then um, well, probably two-thirds of my career, eight-hour shift, and then the last uh, third, a 10-hour shift. And wherever you work, and sometimes I worked within walking distance to work, and sometimes I had a an hour drive, depending wow. on what, what my assignment was. And but it, it's always the same thing. About an hour or two before you go to work, I like working either um, the, the the swing shift, the afternoon into the evening, night shift, or I, or the graveyard shift, the midnight to eight in the morning. And so an hour or two before you you start going to work, you're slightly getting mentally ready for work and you're thinking about it. So you're, you're, you're slowly, your blood pressure's rising up and things are happening within your body. And then you get in your car and you start driving to work. And depending on what kind of job you had, I know I worked gang as a gang investigator for a year. So I'd put on um, rap just to get my thoughts process going to what I'm going to be dealing with. Getting the mode, huh? I get, you know, I'd yeah. put, on a, put on a NWA or something like that. And, and drive to work. But, you know, actually, that's bad for you because by the time I got to work, I was all pumped up, and and I w- I was at the top of that roller coaster. <laughs> you jacked yourself up, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, in the meantime, you're sucking down coffees. Nowadays, people are dr- drinking monsters or other energy drinks, which are totally yeah. bad for you. <laughs> Bang's the new. Th- well, I'm I'm probably already outdated. Yeah, as far as like the, there's always like a new energy drink that the twenty something year olds are in dr- just destroying those and i'm like i think i feel the same way i'm pretty pretty anti-energy drink i know there's going to be a lot of people that are pretty turned off by that but there's just so much stuff in there i just yeah. it's it not coffee yeah it's not good for you um in march i'm going to be writing a blog about sleep sleep is a big mm. thing in law enforcement the lack of sleep and yeah and it's, it's, right now it's the the hot topic in the first responder community and and what energy drinks and coffee do to you because you know coffee's okay until you overdo it but one energy drink has five times as much caffeine as, as coffee so it's it's crazy mm-hmm. but you, you know you you're at the top of this roller coaster and you spend your whole shift there and then on the end of your shift you know, some guys go out and they smash down a bunch of beers and then they drive home or go home. And some guys just go home and smash down a couple, but you're still on this big high and eventually you're going to crash. And when you crash, you're going to crash hard. But when you get into the work life balance, you, because the, within the hyper vigilant thing, you just can't turn it off. It, it, it's going to shut off on its own and there's nothing you can do about it. But in this work life balance, when you, uh, you start to you have to realize to yourself that when you get up on this on this um, top of the roller coaster, you have to start thinking about how to let yourself down and get down. And that's where the life balance comes in. Is when, instead of going home and crashing on the couch and watching forty five, you know, hours of uh, whatever you're gonna mm-hmm. binge on on TV. You know, go out with the kids, play catch with the kids, do something with your wife um, or your spouse. But to totally disorient your you from what you did at work and yeah and by doing so then you you, you start to balance a little bit and you you really want to off about take that and, and put more emphasis on your on your family life than you do your work life and it, you're not just saying it's just a job no this is my job but my family is more important than my job yeah and, and by and by doing that you know you can uh 
I, I think you're going to relieve a lot of the stress, a lot of the um, issues you're going to have with your heart and your health later on, because those are a couple other big things that when, when you get into retirement, you know, when you're, when you're working, law enforcement is a, actually law enforcement is one of the professions, which is a, what we'll call the fattest profession in the world. Um, I think somewhere up in words, I wrote a blog that's going to be published on the first on wellness about this. And it's, uh, I think we're somewhere upwards of 60% of all police officers are, are overweight and 40% or something like that are, uh, mm. are obese. And, and that's nationwide, obviously big city cops compared to smaller cities. It's different. You know, California cops probably aren't as as heavy as Texas cops, and you know, not saying that Texas cops are a bunch of fat guys, but you know, it, it's geographically. Yeah, the, um, per the state. Yeah, outside yeah. of law enforcement, I think yeah, Texas is one of the the highest obesity rates, maybe diabetes rates in the in the nation, and so it may just correlate, right? Yeah, but if I walked outside my door, you know, with brisket every day, then I'd probably be that way too. So yeah, unless <laughs> like, you know, like eat the brisket and skip the sauce, skip the <laughs> cornbread, right? Um, no, you bring up so many good things and so many necessary conversation points, right? And so for those that are newer to the podcast, like I encourage you to scroll back. You know, there's there's a bunch of folks talking about specific health things, right? Um, even you know Dan Zaya, a recent episode. Um, Dan Zaya Joseph, you know, he's talking about psychology and, you know, uh, veteran issues and suicide, but he also talks a bit about sleep. You know, Elena O'Connell, a nurse, talks about sleep practice. Kendall Wood talks about sleep. Uh, yoga Nidra, you know, she's a yoga for first responders. So there's so many crossovers, right? And, you know, you're talking about fitness and that's fantastic, right? We got Bobby Jaramillo, an early episode, Chris Greenway, like form, both former cops that are very much in the the fitness space and trying to spread that positive information to keep people healthy i think it's we need to keep conversations on all fronts and because all these things do contribute towards essentially what we're talking about death prevention right suicide prevention um healthy body healthy mind healthy spiritual health right and so i know that's for some people that aren't religious or don't consider themselves spiritual that could be an uncomfortable topic but think holistically right it's just your connectedness with the world your connectedness with other people um your purpose connectedness with environment with nature right this can all be uh summarized in that way and so i'd venture to guess that even despite anyone's belief of what comes after or what governs all things in the universe and there's there's got to be a connection to something bigger right and so i encourage people to ponder what's right for them um but yeah, talking about Kevin Gilmartin, you know, luckily it became pretty regular to hear about that uh, over here on the West Coast as far as Academy Time and on, talking about the book Emotional Survival for Law Enforcement, uh, critical information in there. And we should all revisit those notions. Um, I'm curious if you recall in the discussion about the hypervigilance cliff that you were describing earlier. Were there takeaways as to how to reduce that, right? So the longer the career, the longer the expanse of trauma exposure, potentially that curb becomes a cliff. And what are some things that can be done to mitigate that? I do have it it's in a chapter in my book. It's uh, basically just changing things around, starting to maintain, one, a healthy life. So I'll get a little bit active. And I'm not talking about going out and running marathons or 5Ks or anything like that. I take a walk around the block. You know, 30, 30 minutes of, uh, of, of activity every day where you get your heartbeat up of over about 100, something like that. That is something to start with. Um, other life, it's just most of it's lifestyle changes. One, talking about it. Talk to your spouse about it. Talk to your friend about it. Um, have outside connections. You know, in law enforcement and in the fire service, we tend to our friends only be cops, and we have to have friends who aren't cops. We have we have to have that balance of people who can bring us back into reality because not everybody out there are bad guys. Not everybody out there is. I'll use the term Adam Henry's, mm -hmm. and uh, um, it's an A and an H. Everybody can put that together. Yeah, so, you know, it's it's not everybody's like that, and and 
that's how some people who are real deep into law enforcement, they see, oh, what's this guy going to do? He's got this. Well, he's not really mm-hmm. a bad guy. He's just kind of wearing, he's sagging and, and wearing a bulky jacket, but he's not a bad guy. You know, mm-hmm. And it, it's things like that. You, you just have to just get your thoughts process off of the, off of the, um, the work pro- part of the job. You still need to be a little bit of vigilant. You still need to, to have your situational awareness but because mm-hmm. you're never going to let your guard down. But you need to just learn how to relax, learn how to take it easy. You, you know, and the guys will go out there and, and they'll drink to oblivion to, to get th- things off their mind. All they're doing is worse, making, making it worse. That just helps bury themselves down. They're not sleeping good. And, Mm-hmm. But to, to to just turn some minor lifestyle things around, change your diet around a little bit. One of the big things with um, in cardiovascular health and within sleep disorders I've been reading about is uh, our intake of sugars and our intake of carbo- car- carbohydrates, especially the bad carbohydrates. It's it's not good for you. You know, on the yeah. on the sleep thing, um, Lieutenant Colonel uh, Dave Grossman, he was an Army Ranger. Most people probably heard of him. He's a West Coast, uh, or West Coast, a West Point psychologist. In a speech he made in Miami, Florida, several years ago, he said that sleep deprivation is the number one reason cops commit um, suicide or die by suicide. Why they make it ethical mistakes and why they use force. Hmm. And he has um, said this, and others have also said. It, studies have sh- showed that. Um, this is from the Sleep Foundation also, is sleeping, oh, so a point, going, not sleeping for eight hours, there we go, working an 18-hour shift is like having an impaired judgment somewhere around a, a 0. 0.05. Yeah, and, and, and that's and something I'm, that us cops are, fr- we're well acquainted with that factoid, right? Sleep deprivation is as bad or worse than being drunk driving yeah, and, you know, and yet d- we do it right we do it we're forced to do it mm-hmm. <laughs> Sometimes. yeah yeah you know you 24 hours you're a 0. 0.10 drunk and, and and that's just amazing you know on, on the on the short term when you're you know you get a an emergency where you're going to be called out for a week or two that's probably not going to be detrimental um to you obviously yeah you're going to go i remember we had um one huge fire uh that burnt down the Angeles National Forest. I mean, from one end of Los Angeles County over into San Bernardino, it was huge. It burned, I think it burned for like uh, 60, 70 days. And we were activated, no days off. We were on 12-hour shifts. We'd do 12 hours at our unit assignment and then uh, up to 22 hours on the fire line every day. You'd, you were bouncing back and forth, either your regular shift or the, or the fire. And it was alternating days. And uh, the unit I was at, I would go to work. I would do about 10, 10 hours of detective work and sleep and then go and do stand guard houses on the fire line and then come back and do the same thing over again. And we went for a week and a half. And, and I think when I finally got a day off, you can ask my wife, I probably slept for 24 hours. Yeah. That short so term. so exhausted, yeah. Yeah, that, that short term is probably not going to cause major issues. But many agencies, departments now, the guys are, they're, they work in 10-hour shifts. They're being forced to work another eight-hour shifts on top of that because of um, uh, personnel shortages. And they're being forced to work 10 hours or 18 hours on their days off and without adequate sleep. And over time, over three or four weeks, it's going to be very detrimental. And uh, there's a, a doctor out there. She's a former. She's an Air Force veteran, a former police officer. And she's the founder of the of the Blue Wall Institute. Her name is uh, Dr. Olivia Johnson. And she came up and with this thing, saying that uh, lack of sleep or sleep deprivation is one of the fatal ten reasons um, people die by suicide. And it's 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 amazing. It's yeah, she's it makes some, sense, right? Yeah, yeah. If she's you unpack some, that. Your your sense of judgment is so poor, right? Your reaction time is so poor. Your brain function. I mean, we've all been extremely exhausted. Those that have worked shift work, those that are on the street, 
those that are new parents, like, you know that you're extremely irritable, you know, you're extremely irrational, you put that together and you compound it with ridiculous amounts of stress, then yeah, like you can be in an unstable, unsettled place. And then, to, uh, you know, the conversation of sleep and how critical it is, it reminds me of, you know, a lot of people doing research in the space, right? Um, you know, you mentioned Dave Grossman. Um, there's, there's a lot of resources like Sean Stevenson wrote a book, Sleep Smarter, and he talks about how sleep deprivation or, excuse me, he talks about how shift work is a carcinogen, right? So you, we have this culture that's like, oh, I'll sleep when I'm dead. And it's like, yeah, he will. Like, <laughs> and you'll die sooner, right? So uh, we need to recover. And I was one of those, right? So a lot of the topics I talk about on the podcast or a lot of the opinions I have have shifted from when I was in my early 20s, when I was doing this job, right? I was just pounding caffeine and I was sleeping four to five hours a day and just thinking I would just grind through, right? But it comes at a cost, right? So I think it's really impactful if people are like, well, I just don't really care about that. I'm going to power through. But I think when you start saying things like cancer, then people slow down and they start to listen. And I think that when you talk about an unhealthy diet, people are like, okay, cool. I'm a little overweight. Maybe my heart isn't as good as it could be. But there's more studies and information linking high sugar diets to Alzheimer's. And then people take a pause, right? Because I was okay dying a couple of years earlier, but Alzheimer's sounds terrifying, right? To myself and my family. And so if we want to talk about brain health and we talk about longevity and not just surviving, but thriving, right? That whole notion, especially as we talk about retirement and what that's going to look like, like we got to do something. And I love how earlier the, in this conversation, you're talking about, it could be small, right? It could be walking around the block. It could be just adding a couple nutritious things to your meal. It could be removing a couple non-nutritious things to your meal, right? You don't have to just completely change up your life. That could be a really daunting and that could be unsustainable for a lot of people. So I love that notion, right? Just start small and build the, from there. One of the things on sleep that I, it's, it's interesting is I'm reading this run, one book. It's in the other room. I'll show you what it is. It was written in 2000. So it's a 20 year old book, but what the, the, the author talks about is, is relates to either 2000 years ago or 2000 years forward from now is we uh, we live in a society now of artificial light so our carcidian system is going all the time and when you're working like a graveyard shift when everybody else is sleeping you're fighting to stay awake so you're getting artificial light and mm -hmm. the artificial light is kind of reprogramming your reprogram your brain to say oh we got to eat that, mm. but, you know, healthy eating is not really good right now. I got to have that donut. And, oh, you know, the donut yeah, shop the just has, aren't great. Yeah. Just have to, it happens to be open. Or, mm -hmm. you know, nowadays you can go to any, almost any fast food place. It's 24 seven and, and drive through there. And it's, you don't have good eating options because all you're doing is pounding down bad food and, and yeah. stuff like that. There was a, a study done a couple of years ago by a, a a suicidologist. I've never heard that term until I, I saw it when I was writing my book. She's from Stanford. She's a, a PhD in psychology, and, and she claims she calls herself a suicidologist. So she studies suicides. She did a 10 year study. And throughout this study, she found out that people who are sleep deprived are 1.4 times more likely to die by suicide than those who are not. And, uh, those are just interesting little things that you yeah. don't think about. And, yeah. But, uh, she's one of them. Let's see. Here. That's huge. Yeah. So, for all those burning it from both ends, yeah, you might get mandated. You might stay up late. That might be part of the job. But on your days off, man, you really have to make that like a number one priority. And for those that are health and fitness minded, I'll even throw this out. And I spoke about this on a recent episode where it's the notion, and I'm stealing this from someone else, but. If you're cutting out an hour of your sleep and you're already sleep deprived, then it, to go work out, then you're stepping over, you know, dollars to get to a dime. So sleep first, right? That's that's your number one priority. Um, at the same time, you can be fueling well and you can be active, right? It doesn't mean you need to go do, you know, a high intensity workout when you're sleep deprived. Maybe you go on a walk, right? You get some nature, 
maybe some natural daylight to help your circadian rhythm, right? As you're talking about, uh, because that blue light, right? It also, you know, halts your melatonin production, which is an integral part to sleeping naturally and healthfully. So um, it halts the melatonin, it increases your cortisol, which uh, is cortisol is a good thing, but it can be a bad thing. Yeah, it and keeps by you increasing up. Yeah. your cortisol, you then you're decreasing your testosterone, you're increasing your estrogen levels. I mean, it's yeah. a, it's a whole wild. Yeah, thing. which will make you moody, right? If your hormones are out of whack and you're stressed. So, what do we do when we're stressed? Like for me, I eat right, and I yeah. like like you said, I eat the bad stuff. Your body is in a state of panic, essentially, and it's thinking it needs to find some survival mechanism, which in the wild would be a super high caloric thing. And unfortunately for us, you know, it's not like getting an apple, right? It's like, I'm going to get this thing that doesn't exist in nature that has so much fat and sugar and salt um, that doesn't even fill me up. It it spikes my blood sugar and clogs my arteries and does all the bad stuff. Yeah, I don't want that apple. It's good. I want that bag of chips. Yeah, exactly. Um, Yeah, yeah, and we covered a lot of ground. I do kind of want to center back on... um, on the sense of balance, right? I think that that's a critical thing that we can wrap all this stuff together. And, you know, you gave us a lot of good conversation points. We discussed a lot of resources, but balance to rewind back a little bit, you're talking about friends and this notion of living outside the blue world. And that's not a new conversation on the podcast or in the first responder community, but I really want to hone in on that, right? Because it's not just me, but we got Danny here, retired Sarge saying, Hey, He's retired. He's been retired for a number of years, and he recognizes the value of that. Um, Super important to have people in the industry that understand the culture and can speak to it, but super important to have people outside of the industry too. And with that vigilance, you know, um, I'll share a note about that, and I kind of want to ask you about that before we wrap, but there has to be a healthy balance, right? And I'm, I'm there, right? I'm essentially in the middle of my career. If I do a full 32 year career, um, to get me to retirement age in this state, but I've been the guy that's, you know, selling something on Facebook marketplace. And as soon as the plan changes and I, you know, told them where I was going to meet and what car I'm going to be in, I'm like, Oh shoot, are they watching me? Are they trying to figure out where I'm going to go? Um, you know, they canceled the, the bot, you know, the purchase of my old furniture that's in the back of the truck. So are they going to be tailing me to see where I am? Like all these things I'm like, bro, like slow down. So I think it could be helpful to have a little bit of situational awareness that we learn in this job, which can keep us safe, keep our family and friends safe. But there's a limit, right? Um, At the same time, you know, like when something falls through, then I think it's a scammer, right? Or um, or just these little things where you think that uh, it's the worst case scenario very quickly. And then you have to remind yourself to dial it back and that, yes, those dangers could be out there. We'll mitigate them but not to live in such a way that it's always the worst case scenario because then you're, you're stressing yourself out unnecessarily. Yeah. We, uh, we, we tend to do that. The, the situational awareness is, uh, you know, retired. I still sit against the wall with my back against the wall, facing the door. Now my, my wife was a police officer for several years, so we fight over it. <laughs> but, <laughs> Who's the better shot? She Who's is got a, the better eyes? <laughs> oh, she, she's, she a much, she's a much better shot, so <laughs> she usually wins. <laughs> That's good. You know, when when you look at the work life balance, there's things that we can do to make it better. And, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna look over on my computer screen right now so I can read them. But uh, you know, we we need to ask ourselves, and this is an honest question. Why did we get into law enforcement? Why did we become a first of our first responder? Why are we firefighters, paramedics, and cops and and stuff? And you know, my answer was because I wanted to drive fast and take bad guys to jail. But uh, in reality, we wanted to to do something for the communities that we live, we work in, and we live in. And uh, but you, you you have to look at yourself honestly. Why did I do this? Some guys, when I came on in the eighties, and it's like now, is people did not want to become cops. People were. Uh, um, it, it was right at the beginning of some tech age or something like that, but they were getting into private industry because private industry was paying a lot more than what law enforcement was paying at the time. Um, and then it kind of changed around a little bit and people going, well, 
uh, right now, law enforcement, they're hiring, so I'm going to get into it because it's a job. And well, it's not just a job. You got to, go, and why did you get, get into this job? If you got into it just because it's a job, uh, you're going to have, you may have issues later on in life. Um, and then you got to do, and what I'm doing at work, actually helping people. And when you work in, in a lower economic area that's very deprived, and you know a high drug area, high crime rate area. You don't seem like you're really doing things, but in reality, you know I worked in Compton, I worked in South Central A, and and those areas they may look like they're a bad area, but in reality, probably between eighty to eighty-five percent of the people that actually live there are law-abiding, very police-supporting individuals. It's mm-hmm. that five to fifteen percent that screw it up for everybody else. And those are the gangsters and the robbers and the and the idiots. And so yes, working those areas, I felt like I was doing something good because I was helping the good people of the community by taking the bad people of the community to jail. And that's how you have to look at it. When you when you work in a gang unit and you can you can get a guy out of gangs and into something um, useful. When you work in narcotics and you can get someone out of the narcotics industry and into rehab and into cleaning themselves up, that's why we do the job. That's that's what makes it worthwhile. And on top of that, when you take that bad guy to jail, that makes it fun too. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, Man, I, there's, a, there's a focus on the majority that I think is a really healthy conversation. Um, you're talking about how we see the worst, right? In this job, when you go to a 911 call, you're seeing people at their worst moments. And a lot of times you're seeing the worst of human society doing the worst things, right? And that's not most people. And I know that it's so hard to fight that cynicism sometimes, but let's flip it this direction where a, a legit bad cop does a terrible thing and it's in the national news or international news, right? We know that well. And we have to recognize in the community that that's a minority. That's an extreme minority, right? Most cops, the extreme majority of cops are out there doing their best and they're doing it for good reasons. And so if you flip that same kind of mindset, you have to recognize that most people are doing the right thing. They're doing the good thing. Not just cops are moral, right? Most people want to do good. And really all they want is they want a safe community for themselves for their loved ones, for their kids, and so on, right? So we're all in this together. And so um, I think that's a healthy recognition that you touched on, which is that most people are good. And that's we have to keep that hopeful mentality. Otherwise, we're I think we're fraught with peril. You know, if we're going to go down this like slippery slope into darkness or else like, what's it all for? And how are we going to climb out of that if we're not optimistic about it? Right. It's, uh, you know, in the, in the law enforcement community, there's roughly uh, about 850,000 cops in the United States right now. Um, two years ago, there was slightly over a million. So that lets you know that it's a, a lot of people have left the profession. But out of those 850,000 police officers, we are less than a, a minuscule. If you take one point one point oh one percent of those, or one percent of those, I guess, you know, that's 8,000, 8,500 8, 8, police officers that are, would be dirty. We're less than that. We're, there's probably maybe 800 bad cops in the United States right now that we can actually say, no, you, dude, you got to get out of the job. There's, there's not that many. But when the public sees that, it's like they just brandish all 850,000 of us as, as, as bad. And, and, you know, in the retirement community, we take that just as hard as, as the working community. And it, yeah, and it's that's why I I'm all for, you know I'm big on integrity. When I I, I learned about integrity from a kid, growing up, you know I, I became an Eagle Scout. You can't be in that position unless you have a high sense of integrity. Obviously, being a cop, you know when you get hired as a police officer, they check you upside down every way. You know my background was investigation was seven months, and I think that that's Man. about what the average is. So they wow. check everything about you just to make sure that that you are who you are. Then you got to go through a, a lie detector test and a, and a and a psychologist, and 
just to get hired. So law enforcement does a real good job of vetting uh, their officers. Unfortunately, a couple will squeak through, but mm-hmm. not that many. And, and yeah, that's where... and not everyone does a great job too, right? And so, you know, you got to consider, uh, you know, L.A. County sheriffs like seven months and back then, but now we're all we're all playing a dangerous game because we are rushing backgrounds, right? And so, you know, my agency, we became really efficient, but we had to continually have the conversation, hey, let's be quick and efficient, but not at the sacrifice of quality, not at the sacrifice of thoroughness. But it is kind of that rat race where, you know, everyone's scrambling for a really good police candidate, but I know it's happening, right? And I know specifically because I've been to the state academy and I've seen people that we passed on for questionable integrity issues hired on and patched in by someone else. And I'm like, man, someone's not doing their homework. And um, and there's a specific example without sharing the details where I was extremely sketched out when I saw this one person. You know, sometimes it's a little subjective. Sometimes it's different standards, uh, different barrier of entry. Uh, but there was this one person that I remembered had extreme issues and and I only remembered it because he was kind of <laughs> he was kind of staring me down and I didn't remember why like I didn't really remember his face but I was like why is this guy looking at me and I got like when I started pondering and I was like man I wonder if it's that one dude and I contacted the academy I was like hey is this person enrolled right now and sure enough he was and he was hired by this other agency in the state and you know I asked for an agency contact and I wanted to see if, Hey, I'm not trying to get this guy fired, but I was like, Hey, I don't remember you reaching out to our agency to ask about this guy. And I've been in the hiring unit. So do you want to see what we found? And the agency was fantastic, right? It's like partnership, right? They're like, yeah, send me what you got. I know he didn't disclose that he tested with you. Well, that's a red flag. Like it says explicitly, you have to disclose everything. So uh, not to make it too much about that story, but he already had all these issues and he was on the way out and this was like the nail in the coffin. So it just showed that, um, you know, some people do squeak through, right? And we have to admit that if we're going to get better about it. But what I do like about that story is there was a reason why he was caught, right? There's a reason why he was on their, um, why he was flagged already and went them, right? He was only a recruit, but they had already started building a file and it was manifesting in all these negative ways because he's a bad character. He was not a well-intended guy. Um, and I feel really fortunate that we're in this community that even if some people squeak through, man, hopefully we'll find it fast. And this was an example of that. Yeah, they'll, they'll find out. When uh, when I got hired, they, they were in a hiring rush for the Olympics and uh, a handful of people squeaked through. I actually went through the academy with a couple of them and it's they didn't last much more than I think a handful of guys got washed out of the academy because it came up when they they were in the academy that they uh, they weren't all that up and up and then a couple of guys once they got into the jail system and and work in the jail their true colors started to show and mm-hmm. so they were taken care of during their probationary period I'd yeah. like to say um, you know, for the most part most of the guys won't get past their probationary period. Unfortunately, then you turn around and and uh, get into, especially back in the 80s and 90s, into when drugs were king and, and pay was low for cops. You know, the, a lot of the departments, a lot of the narco units and stuff like that got into stealing drugs and stealing drug money instead of mm. booking it. And that was a big black eye, and I worked for a department that uh, had that happen to, and but uh, it was cleaned up. I know LAPD had issues with that. New York PD had issues. Lo- probably most big law enforcement agencies had issues yeah. with the with the drug money issues. So but yeah, and that's I appreciate. All gone now. Yeah, and it's good to. We need to talk about that stuff, right? It's not to draw like all the negative attention all the time, but it's like no, we got to own our past. And even if you and I weren't there, we weren't doing the things. Um, it helps build trust when we can recognize when we messed up, even if it was not us. Like It's the industry. It's the institution. And so we can say, hey, we're better about it. And people can better believe that when we're not trying to hide everything, right? When we're trying not to distract and, and you know, sweep stuff under the rug. Um, you know, it's kind of like just taking ownership, right? Hey, I, I understand that there's some people that feel a certain way about police, but, but we're about being transparent, right? We're about um, 
being about how to be better and sharing that, right? And so I I only take the time to mention that because there are some some cops that they get super uncomfortable and defensive and they would prefer not to speak about that ever again, right? The dark chapters in police history. It's like, but if we don't learn from history, we're going to repeat it, right? Um, yeah, that, that, that's part of the integrity issue. Own it. You know, mm-hmm. if I do something and it was wrong, I, I own it. And that's, if you do that throughout your career, you're probably going to have a pretty good career. If yeah. it's when you don't own it is when, when you're going to have issues. So, so you got to own it. Talk, just talk. Uh, the one thing I want to mention is, uh, you know, I'm seeing all these huge hiring bonuses now, you know, up to a hundred thousand dollars hiring. Yeah. Bonuses. Alameda so, County is doing like 75 so, grand. Yeah. And the, yeah, I, I just don't see how that's going to work out in the long run. It's, it's it's actually scary. Plus, you need a hundred thousand um, dollar hiring bonus to live in Alameda County just to to get an apartment. Yeah, so I expensive. posted that, and a lot of people were like, "There's a reason why you're having to hire for that much money, and it's a red flag." And someone else is like, "Yeah, the cost alone." Like, they're kind of comparing notes, and yeah, it's such an interesting paradigm these days. Danny, I really appreciate uh, the conversation, uh, you coming on, sharing all these insights and critical topics. If you could leave the listeners with information about your book and where they can find you. Okay, I am. I wrote a book. It's called Broken, Understanding the Effects of Post-Traumatic Stress. It is on Amazon, and the easiest way to find it is just to type in my name, Danny Kuhn, in the, uh, in the search engine for, uh, in, in the Amazon search engine. And um, I also am a blogger. I have a website. It's Bulletproof First Responder, all one word, bulletprooffirstresponder.com, all one word. And in that, I write uh, mostly monthly blogs about um, issues relating to post-traumatic stress and suicidal education or suicide education. And Eric, I, my, I blog just about, wrote a blog on just about everything we talked about today. So it's, there's blogs in there. Um, go to the website, check it out. Again, uh, bulletprooffirstresponder.com. And the name of the book is Broken. It's a B-R-O apostrophe. No, excuse me, semicolon. B-R-O semicolon K-E-N. And uh, the semicolon represents a pause. Uh, and in the mental health area, it's a pause between life and death. So you're mm. pausing so you can march forward onto life instead of staying stagnant and into death. So, Yeah. Well, Danny, thank you for sharing your story, your insights. Uh, thank you for your continued passion to support the community, the culture, the job. And keep fighting the good fight, man. I appreciate it. And I'm glad to have come acquainted with you. Thank you, Eric. And thank you for having me as your guest. It's uh... Thank you for tuning into another episode of Blue Grit Radio. As always, support this community by subscribing, giving us a five-star review, and following, liking, and sharing posts on Blue Grit Wellness on Instagram. You can reach me there or email me at bluegritwellness at gmail.com. Be well and stay gritty.